We are going to look at mobile development and then I don't know what we're going to look at. I forgot. All right, I'll have to look at my notes. <laughs> um, we talked about last time the, the ways that browsing a website versus mobile is different than um, browsing it on a desktop machine. And I mean, there's the various obvious ways, right? The smaller screen. You're likely to have a slower internet connection. You're likely to have less powerful hardware. You interact with it in a different way. You touch it as opposed to um, clicking a mouse. Your keyboard is going to be probably a virtual keyboard instead of an actual physical keyboard. Um, now the interesting thing here is I'm saying mobile devices though that's one thing, right? There's actually a whole range of things. There's the old flip phones that some people still use to smartphones to tablets. So all of those fall into the category of mobile device, but they're clearly not all the same. All right. So we do have to be uh, aware of that. But in general, we can make some of uh, make some conclusions about mobile devices versus browsing on a desktop or a laptop. The other thing that we said that is that is just as important is besides the physical difference between mobile devices and desktop slash laptops, there is the um, how do I want to say the um, usage difference, the difference in goals that people have when they're surfing the web versus a uh, on a desktop versus a laptop. Typically, um, mobile devices typically aren't used for extended browsing sessions. All right. Again, your mileage may vary, but as a general rule, people accessing the web via mobile devices tend to be more focused. They're not going to meander around the website. They're going to look up the information they want and, and be done with it. All these things point to a website on a mobile device needing to be simpler than a website on a desktop device. All right. So how do we achieve that? Before we talk about that, the other component in this is a mobile app. All right. Is everyone clear what I mean the difference when I talk about the difference between a mobile app and a mobile website? A mobile app typically will have an icon on your screen. You'll click it. You'll run the app. If you went to the Weather Channel's mobile app, you would click it and it would bring up the weather, bring that up. As opposed to opening up a mobile web browser, like either Safari on an iPhone or Chrome on a uh, Android device, and then accessing a web page just like you would access any other web page. And here is sort of the the bottom line with this. Many organizations will not choose between doing a mobile website and an app, but will rather do both. Right? Um, that's what makes mobile development so, so, so tricky these days. Not only do you have to develop for an app versus a website, on the app side you have to develop Android versus iOS. Now there's ways to get around that. I won't say to get around that, there's ways to mitigate some of the, the extra work involved and all that. But that's a topic for uh, some of the mobile development classes that we have. All right. The bottom line is it's not an either or. An organization may have an app, all right, and the, the benefit of an app is it's, it's typically more convenient, more focused. You don't have to open a browser and navigate to a page. You just click on the icon and there you go. All right. An app can be optimized for a particular device, so an app can integrate more easily with your contacts, for example, on, a, on an iPhone or an Android device. Mobile websites, again, are using HTML and as such are, are less likely to integrate with those sorts of things. 
But the bottom line is, is it's not an either or. It's going to be probably both. All right. Now, again, the key for developing mobile websites is to make things simpler. All right. Let's look at the ingredients that will go in. Well, let's look at the three strategies that you can adopt with a mobile website. We, we touched on these last time. Let's, let's formalize them and talk about them. And then we'll talk a little bit about the stuff that we're not going to talk about, if that's not a paradox. <laughs> One size fits all. Three general strategies that you can adopt in mobile is first of all have a one size fits all. You create a design that can work, that's effective both on a desktop environment and on a mobile environment. And that that is that is feasible uh, probably in a case where you don't have that complicated of a website. You don't have that big of a website. If we had for example, the, the example I love to, to give is a, a website for a restaurant. Website for a restaurant is typically very straightforward. All right, it's gonna you know it's gonna have some you know the location of the restaurant, what some of their specialties are, what some of their specials are, maybe a few other things on it. But you're not talking about like a hundreds of pages. You're you're talking about probably five or six pages, something like that. It would be possible to create a single website with a single CSS file that could work and would look good uh, across a variety of different platforms. So yeah, you might run into that. All right. The second case is to have the same web pages, the same HTML, but apply different style sheets to them depending on the kind of device that you're on. Now I'm, I'm talking about this as though there's two styles, you could actually do better than that. You could actually, um, depending on the kind of mobile device, show the page differently. All right. If someone was using a flip phone, you could actually use a very bare bones site that would look like the kinds of sites that we used that, that we did the first week of class with no styling whatsoever, because that's what works on flip phones. All right. To being a little more extensively styled on a smartphone, to being full blown uh, on a desktop or laptop. So I say two, but it could actually be more than two. All right. These two are related in the sense that we're having one set of HTML and maybe multiple CSS. This is the odd one out, and this is the one that we're not going to talk about. This requires, typically, this requires server-side scripting. The way this works is, you have your client who connects to the internet. That connects to the web server of your organization. And again, I'm showing it as though there's only two options, but in reality there could be more than two. There's actually a little traffic cop in this website, a little piece of server-side coding that looks at the request that comes in and says, did that come from a mobile device or not? And if it came from a mobile device, it delivers this set of files. If it came from a desktop machine, it delivers this set of files. And you could actually make that more extensive. You could have three or four. You could have a um, a flip phone version 
All right, you could have a smartphone version, you could have a tablet version, and you could have a full desktop slash laptop version. In that case, there's snippets of code that live on the web server that act like a traffic cop, that direct the user to certain files depending on um, the environment, the, the platform that the um, client used to request the pages. This kind of thing you see a lot, and this kind of thing is um, popular when you have like very large sites. All right, and where the, the the goals and the appearance for a mobile user is going to be drastically different than for a desktop user. All right, and you can tell this typically when you go to a site, you'll notice that the URL changes. So, if I go in here, and I type in Um, wouldn't you know, I can't find an example now. Yeah, this one, I'll, this one will work, I guarantee. I don't guarantee, but... I'm optimistic. If this doesn't work, I'm just going to flash the phone up very quickly so that you can't possibly read what it says. And I'm going to tell you. Okay. I actually think that Okay, this will work. Uh, I went to Comcast's site, which apparently is Xfinity now. All right. And notice the URL on it is Xfinity.com. Whoops. When I go and visit it, on my desktop or on my mobile device notice that it looks a little different all right and if we look closely at the URL you'll notice that there is a slash M after it in other words it was smart enough to know that I requested this page from a mobile device and therefore the traffic cop on the web server sent me to a different set of pages. And those, sets of, those pages look different than these. Not drastically different, but notice the navigation is different. Um, 
navigation, instead of appearing going across, is accomplished through this little thing where you click on that and you get your links like that. Okay? So this method more or less involves creating two separate sites. All right. Now, as a software developer, you should flinch when someone says create two separate sites for the same organization. Why? Because that could be twice as much work. All right. However, there are ways that you can, if you are clever, and if you use my inspired laziness concept, where you can sort of make up for it. So it's not like doing two complete brand new sites. You can, you can use some resources on both sites so that you're not duplicating your effort exactly. You're putting in more effort for sure, but you're not duplicating it. This piece we are not going to talk about because it requires the ability to write server-side script. All right. Server-side script are in languages like PHP and A, uh, ASP.NET using C Sharp and, and other platforms. That's where essentially the web server doesn't contain an HTML page. It contains a little program that writes HTML pages for you. And you write the program that writes the HTML pages. So you just sort of bump things up a level. And the advantage is, for those of you that have done programming in C-sharp or other languages, is you have all the capabilities associated with a programming language. So you can write an if statement. And again, you probably have seen if statements if you've done any other programming. Or even if you've done Excel, you probably have seen if statements. An if statement says, if this is true, do this. If that is true, do that. So we can have a little server-side code that says, if the person's on a mobile device, send them over that way. If they are on a desktop machine, send them this way. Our focus is going to be on these models, though. So we're not going to talk about this. So, what's the trick with this? What are the, the goals of this? Or what are the techniques used for this? Most of our sizes and most of our layout is going to be percentage based and floating. So we're not going to do a lot of things like, say, put this navigation 800 from the left and 200 from the top. Why? Well, uh, on, a, on a small phone, 800 for the left may be off the side of the screen. All right. So we're going to do things based on percentages, not absolute. Now, the one thing I will say is things such as minimum width are acceptable. It's funny, you know, programmers being very detailed folk will sometimes look and say, well, when I have this window and I narrow it down to be 10 pixels wide, my website doesn't look good. Well, yeah, but no one's ever going to narrow their window to 10 pixels wide, so you don't really need to worry about that. All right? So, it's okay to, like, use minimum width. All right? But in general, you don't want to use absolute positioning. You don't want to use absolute size. You want to use percentage-based widths, and um, you want to use floating layouts. Minimum widths being OK. Yes? Could you have a percentage-based No. That, that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, I say that. Yeah, what, the, what would the difference between a width and a minimum width be in the case of percentage? All right, number two. We're going to do percentage-based for all media. 
So we're going to make our images percentage based. All right. So we're going to say that an image takes up 50% of the screen. All right. That way, if you have a monitor, it'll be a certain size. If you have a mobile device, it'll take up 50% of the screen. It won't be a gigantic image being displayed on a tiny mobile screen. And the third piece of this is we're going to use what are called media queries. This shouldn't be new to you. We've talked about this before. This shouldn't be drastically new for you. We haven't talked about it before, but if you look at it, and you could say, oh, I can put a percentage width on an image? Oh, I didn't know that. And, okay, now you know it. <laughs> All right. The media queries, though, we haven't touched on yet. And media queries is where you can specify rules in your CSS that says that this CSS applies under this condition, a different CSS applies under a different condition. And that's what we're going to look at today. Again, the, the focus is not to make you an expert in this kind of stuff, but just introduce you to the concept. The best thing you can do, you know, if this interests you, and frankly, if you're a web developer, it ought to interest you, but the most important thing that you can do is um, be sure to practice these two things when you develop your pages. So, let me bring down an example. I posted yesterday to Canvas. I wonder how many semesters it's going to take for me to get used to saying Canvas and not Angel. under files, I think. Archive is the one. If you're looking at the files for the examples, generally speaking, if you look at the date that it was created, that will tell you. So for example, the files that we used on Tuesday, 714, have a date of 714. Alright. Archive is 715. We didn't have class 715. Obviously, that was yesterday, but contrary to popular belief, we professors do not go and lounge at the beach um, all the time. We actually work between classes, if you can imagine that. I have some friends that just that never seem to get that idea. They're, they're like, you mean you only work two days a week? Well, I'm only in class two days a week. This is over the summer. You know, it's like I, I, am, I grade, I answer emails, I prep, I probably work seven days a week. Not full eight hour days, mind you, but all right, enough of my personal problems. All right, I have two examples here and we'll, I'm not sure which we'll go over. Might go over both of them. You know, I didn't want to do that. Here's a page, all right? I don't hold this up as a model of great web design. I mean, um, obviously this, this black text against this dark background is probably not good, but I have a very simple, very basic design here. Let's actually view this on a, uh, or yeah, th this is how this looks in a, on a desktop machine. Let me go up and pull up the same page on a mobile device. Here is the page. This is the exact same HTML.
All right. Nothing on my sleeve. I promise I'm not lying or cheating or anything like that. This page is different than this page. It looks different, yet it's the same HTML. If we were to do a view source, it would be identical. Well, how do we do such wizardry? Well, we do it using media queries. So let's take a look at the HTML of this guy. And we'll see that I actually have two style sheets. One is called screen and one is called handheld. But notice I have an extra attribute on the link. This is called a media query. Media queries are used to tell the browser when the style sheet applies. These have been around for a long time. This is what's called a media query. Media equals screen is a media query. It's a simple media query. The one on the next line is a more exciting one. All right. Back in the old days, people used media queries for things like a print version of a page. All right. So I may have, for example, a map, a campus map, let's say. All right. Now, it might be on my website. Here's the campus map. And then I may have a printable version of it. All right. Now, I want to make sure the printable version stays in sync with the version that you view on the website, right? How do you make sure things are consistent? By not having two of them, <laughs> all right? By having one of them. However, when I go to print out the map, I don't need things like the navigation and uh, the contact us and all that stuff. I just need the map and maybe some text. So I could use a CSS file when I print it out to make it look more plain, all right? Maybe if there's a color background, use a white background and, and black print instead. So that's a very common use of a media query, to have a print version of a web page. You see that a lot of times on news sites. News sites, you will view the page. It may have any sort of colors uh, for it. But when you go to print it, you pull up a print version of the page, and that is typically black and white, and it gets rid of some of the extraneous stuff. All right. Media queries can also be used to tell under what conditions to apply the style sheet regarding the kind of device. So in this case, this applies for screens. Screen means computer screen. This media query says if it's a handheld device, i.e. a mobile device. People use the term mobile device now in the old days, five years ago. <laughs> People use the term handheld device, typically. And this says that if it's a computer screen and the width is less than a, a thousand pixels. A thousand pixels is kind of big. I'd probably change this to 800, but this would allow me, if, if someone had a really old monitor that was really small, this style sheet would apply as well. The reason that this is in here is some devices identify themselves as being screens, even though they're handheld devices. So this is a little catch. In other words, if I'm on a mobile device or the device says it's a screen, and the width is less than 1,000 pixels, apply the style sheet. Now, which style sheet applies? Well, they can both apply. 
and the one can overrule the other. So for example, in this case, there's one style sheet, here's the other. The handheld one has a black text on a white background. That overrules the background of tile JPG. Oh, the background white overrules the tile background. So if you have more than one style sheet applying, then the second one wins. Alright? Uh, this is assuming they're both external style sheets. If they're both incorporated into your page, or if one's incorporated into the page, I think the one that's incorporated into your page wins. But in this case, they're both external style sheets, so the second one wins. So what you can actually do is you can set up all sorts of styling in the first style sheet and then under certain conditions you can overrule the styling. All right. Let's look at a, another example of this. Graceful degradation and progressive enhancement are two sort of styles of mobile development. With graceful degradation, you start with a completed desktop website and then you trim away the stuff that is not needed on a mobile site. With progressive enhancement, you start out designing the bare bones mobile site, then you add features for the more powerful hardware, larger screens, etc. They both end up with the same results and they both use the same techniques. In one case, you start complicated and whittle it down. In another case, you start simple and build up on it. A lot has to do with what you have inherited. For example, if you go to an organization and they have a desktop site that they love, that they don't want to change, well, then you're going to use graceful degradation to whittle it down to a workable mobile version. If, however, you're developing a brand new website for an organization and they don't have any website, a new, new organization, or they want to completely redo their website, then you might use the progressive enhancement where you start out with the mobile and then build it up for the other one. Let's look at the progressive enhancement. All right. Notice a couple things. First of all, this image is based on percentages. As I make it bigger or smaller, the image itself gets bigger and smaller. Let's look at the code for that. These are the two style sheets that are relevant. These style sheets were mentioned in your textbook. These get around some of the HTML5 compatibilities. So what I'm doing in this case is I have a base style sheet that is sort of my baseline, simplest style sheet. Here I have adding in if it's a screen and it's at least 600 pixels wide, then this style sheet applies. So if we look at that style sheet, the desktop style sheet, you'll notice that the image has a width of 100%. So by making it width of 100%, it's going to fill the size of its container. And its container in this case is 
this section here. So as that section gets bigger, the image gets bigger. As that section gets smaller, that image gets smaller. Now again, both these style sheets apply. The base applies and the desktop applies in this situation. All right, in this situation, the desktop applies. Now, Unfortunately, I can't show you this on a mobile device, but I can simulate that by getting rid of this style sheet. Let's pretend it's still there and I'm viewing it on a mobile device. This is how it will look. Again, a simpler layout. And did you notice something about this? How big's the picture in this version? There ain't no picture. All right. Why is that? Well, let's look at the CSS that accomplishes that. Section image display none. That will not display the image. All right. Now, why did it display on the desktop version? Well, on the desktop version, remember, we have both these style sheets I'm applying. So the first style sheet comes through and makes the, the image invisible. The second style sheet comes through and makes it visible again. Let's look at the second style sheet. Ah. We don't say display none, we say display inline, and we set the width to 100 pixels. 100% rather. So in other words, we can define rules, and each subsequent style rule can overrule the style rules in the previous style sheet. So with progressive enhancement, we design our first style sheet being a very bare bones style sheet. Very simple design to be used for mobile devices. We then add on stuff. All right, what's the difference between the two views? Well, notice this is single column. Notice that the links are oriented horizontally. Notice that there's no image. Now, in our desktop version of this, we have a background image on the page. We have multiple columns. And our navigation is oriented vertically and is on the side of the page. All this starts by following the basic fundamental rules of separating your presentation from content. So sometimes I'll say to students, don't use a break tag. Don't use a table for layout. Don't do this. Don't do that. Why do I say that? I say that because those are things that have to do with the appearance of the page. And anything that deals with the appearance of the page ought to be in the CSS. All right ought to be in the CSS. Why? Because then we can change it. The nice thing is, is with a little bit of JavaScript, we could add to that mobile page the ability to see pictures if the person wanted to. They could click a link to say, show me the picture, and boom, it would show them the picture. All right. We haven't talked about JavaScript yet in this class. We'll probably touch on it a bit, but um, that's the sort of thing um, that we will, uh, uh, that's the sort of thing that you could do with JavaScript. Yes? 
Um, we touch on a little bit of JavaScript. Um, there also is a class CISS 232, which is client-side and server-side scripting, that talks about JavaScript and PHP. So, the fundamentals are, make a good CS, make a good page where the, all of the appearance is handled in the CSS, use floating, use relative sizes or percentage-based sizes for things, images and content, and then you can use media queries to say what style sheet applies under what circumstances, and you can actually have your page look different for each for, for different environments. Now, in this case, I did two style sheets. I did a mobile and a desktop. You could do several style sheets. And if it's an old, old mobile device, you could have it look one way. If it's a smartphone, look another way, and so on down the line. These techniques, too, are sort of mix and match, the ones I had up there before. So, for example, you could still use these responsive techniques, as they are called, even if you have two separate websites. You can make your page responsive so that on different mobile devices it, it, it looks good because we use percentages instead of absolute numbers for sizes of things. Questions about any of this? Yes? Well, I would need to see a specific example. Remember, if it was literally margin, 50 pixel, 20%, all right, what that would mean is the top and bottom margin would be 20 pixels and the side margins would be 20%. Or whatever you said, 50 pixels on the top and bottom and 20% on the sides. Because if you say margin and you have two values, the first value corresponds to the top and bottom, the second uh, value corresponds to the right and left. So that probably is what, what's going on there. You can do it. It sometimes gets to be confusing when you do it. And it really gets confusing if you mix things like absolute positioning and floating and stuff like that. That's where the real sort of trouble comes in. Other questions? And guess what? I remembered what I wanted to talk about. What does... Uh, are there questions about this? Ah, ah RGBA. Very good. Um, let me... Think of what the A stands for. A stands for alpha or opacity. So for example, let's look at. Let me try to find which one it's in. Yeah. Ah, here we go. RGBA. Um, the last number is the opacity. So this would be 50%, uh, so it would be see-through. One would be um, solid, zero would be invisible. And then the sliding between there. Right. You can do, you can do it like that, right? A different way to do it. You know, it, it's funny. It, it's good, I think, sometimes that I just make examples at different points in time because uh, some of my examples aren't consistent. You know, I may do opacity in one case. I might do R, RGB in another case. But the nice thing is that that shows you that there's different ways to do it. So if you encounter it other places, then, then it's clear uh, what, that, what that means. Other questions?
All right. What does what does website accessibility mean to you? People with disabilities accessing the web. All right. People with disabilities, you know, encounter obstacles whether you're talking about real life or, you know, <laughs> Funny, I said real life, I, like, like the web is some imaginary thing, right? Uh, in the physical world and, and also in the virtual world. However, we can accommodate folks with those sorts of needs. What are some accommodations that exist in the physical world, in this very building, to accommodate people that have certain disabilities? Push button, open doors. Elevator. Well, that, that still counts. Parking spots. Um, I don't know for sure, but I'll bet if we go out here and look. Well, they made a liar out of me. It isn't the case. Many rooms have, have the room number in Braille outside of them. All right? Um, this one doesn't, unfortunately. All right? And, you know, you have, the, you know, you have uh, bathrooms for people with disabilities and so on. All right? Also in the real world, there are certain technologies which assist people that have disabilities? What are some technologies that exist, that, that, that help assist people in the real physical world that have disabilities? Okay, text reader would be an example like on a computer, on a web. What about on a, in the real world, real physical world, walking around the building? A wheelchair. A wheelchair. All right, what else? Crutches, all right. Crutches, cane, seeing eye dog, ramp, ramps. Yeah, uh, in a way, I guess we could count that as a technology, or we could say that that is an accommodation. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there's two things that we can. There's two things that help people with disabilities in the physical world. There are accommodations that can be made. And there is technology which assists the people. And I realize, like something like a ramp, you could probably put that in either category. Yeah, big technology back in Egyptian times, exactly. All right. And here's the bad thing. That without the accommodations, which typically the person that's building the building would put in there, Bad design can defeat the assistive technologies, right? In other words, let's say I had a building with stairs and no ramps or elevators. Well, the person's wheelchair isn't going to do them any good then. All right? The design, the poor design can defeat the assistive technology. All right? Or if I made the rooms too narrow, or I'm not, I'm sorry, not the rooms, the doors too narrow, all right? So, there's accommodations that they can make, and then there's assist assistive technologies that people can use to get around their different disabilities. Here's the thing about the assistive uh, technologies, or the, or I'm, I'm sorry, about the accommodations. Um, I don't know if anyone has walked into with, uh, to me this term, you know, walked into the building with me this term, but I would not call myself disabled, yet sometimes I use the elevator, all right? Why do I use the elevator sometimes? Well, 
I had an injury, and it still bugs me from time to time, depending on the weather and what I did the day before and all that. Going upstairs can be hard. All right? So I wouldn't call myself handicapped or disabled, yet sometimes the accommodations made for people with disabilities help me out. What are other circumstances where uh, some accommodations for people with disabilities might help someone that doesn't even have disabilities? Someone is injured, so sort of a, a temporary disability. Okay. Okay. Um, someone that is distracted, the audio cues that, that certain crosswalks give you could, could help someone. Well, automatic doors are great at the grocery store. Why is that? If you're carrying a lot of stuff. And the same could be said for like the elevator. You know, if I was, you know, if I, if I was, you know, had uh, tons of stuff I was carrying in, my arms were full, it would be nice to use the elevator and so on. Now, other times, these accommodations are there and they won't necessarily help people that don't have disabilities. But you know what? Chances are they're not going to bother them either. All right? Classic example would be like the, um, unfortunately we don't have here, but the braille for the door numbers. All right? Um, very few people that can see would ever use the braille for the door numbers to find the room. It's much easier to, to visually look and see the room. But you know what? The fact that there's a couple dots underneath the, the door number and there's braille there, or like there being braille on ATM machines, all right? That's not going to bother someone that doesn't have that disability. They may not use it, but it doesn't interfere with their, your ability to, to find your room or to uh, take money out via the ATM. These concepts are known as universal design. In other words, you don't design for people with disabilities. You design for everyone. All right? And some of the accommodations you make for, for people with disabilities will benefit everyone under certain conditions. And under other conditions, they're really not going to do any harm. All right? They're not going to distract you or, or cause a problem. What are some of the disabilities that would affect the way a person accesses the web? What are some of the disabilities? Pardon me? Blindness. Blindness. That's certainly the most obvious one. And it's okay to start with that, but we shouldn't end with that. In about 10 minutes now, you'll probably know more than many web developers out there about accessibility. Because many web developers simply think, well, accessibility is developing websites that work for blind people. Well, yeah, that's, that's a very obvious case of a disability that affects someone. Um, but it's certainly not the only one. Now, is blindness the only sort of visual condition that would affect someone's ability to access the web. What are some other visual disabilities that would affect someone accessing the web that's not necessarily full blindness? Colorblind. What else? Yeah. <laughs> Just plain old bad eyes. All right. And we'll notice this as we go across all of these different disabilities. There typically is going to be a very severe form of the disability that really has a major impact. But there's also going to be variations of that disability that may not have quite as big of an impact 
but also do have an impact. And therefore, some of the disabilities or some of the accommodations we make may benefit not just people with the most severe disabilities, but people with milder versions of the disability. The elevator, me walking up the elevator with my injury, or not walking up the elevator, me riding up the elevator with my injury is a great example of that. You know, The elevator, you could say, is an assistive technology for people that are in wheelchairs. Yes, it's true, but I'm not in a wheelchair, all right? Yet, I do have some problems walking, all right? I do experience some difficulty walking. Therefore, hey, it benefits me as well. And then it can benefit people situationally, like maybe you twisted your ankle the night before or whatever. So blindness isn't the only uh, disability. Uh, it's not even the only visual disability. What are some other disabilities that can affect people's ability to access the web? Mobility. mobility. Physical. Can you clarify that? Well, I know sometimes that my fingers are sometimes pressed too wide. Okay. Now that they're older, my young kids, can, they press too many buttons at once. Okay. Okay, um, th that, is, that is true, being able to click on small links. Um, our focus, um, that is definitely true in the case of a mobile device, all right? And, and e even me with big hands, I mean, it's like, I mean, come on, I'll hit six keys at once going to, to, to press it. What about on a desktop computer, though? How could mobility come into play there? Okay. All right. Um, paraplegic or paralyzed, missing limbs. Those are certainly dramatic cases of that. Yes. Okay, we'll put that one down here. That really isn't related to mobility, but seizures is definitely a disability that is relevant here. What about motion now? These are obviously dramatic. What are some less severe cases of motor control? Motor control, that's what I want. That's the word I was searching for. Arthritis. Arthritis. What else? Yeah. Cerebral palsy. Hand shaking. Certain neurological diseases cause that. Um, another one, carpal tunnel. All right. Seizures is... Uh, a good, uh, another example of a disability that could affect someone's um, experience on the web. What are some other? Deaf. Right. Deaf could allow you to miss the content. What's a milder version of deaf? Hard of hearing. All right. Poor hearing. And here's an interesting thing. If you don't have a disability, what if you're in a noisy place? All right. You're on your laptop and you're over in the college center and some kind of event is going on. All right. You're in a noisy place. You, know, you could have your headphones there. All right. What if you're in a computer lab and there's no speakers and you don't have headphones? All right. So these are all cases of there's no disability at work here, but circumstances sort of put you in the same category as someone with those disabilities. Other potential disabilities. 
mental disabilities? What would what would be an example of that? Uh, dyslexia. dyslexia. We'll call it cognitive. Pardon me? Okay, interesting, interesting uh, point. Let, let's go with that. We're, we're going we're gonna to go a little out of sequence here, but what could you do with someone with dyslexia? Yes? Uh, say you put links on pictures instead of like words. Okay. They can see what they're going to. Okay. You could use pictures along with words. That's one way that you could do it. All right. Another way you can do it is you mentioned a clear font and hmm yeah and good spacing but as you correctly identified that's just good web design principles alright and that's another part of the equation here a lot of this that we're going to talk about here is just plain good web design principles to begin with you know you may do it for one reason and you get the benefit of that Another thing you could do with this, again, depending on how much effort you wanted, you needed to put into it or whatever, is you could give the user a choice of fonts. Okay? Um, a, uh, and in that way, or a choice of color combinations. And in that way, they could pick what worked best for them. All right? So yes, part of this is, yeah, you, you, you know, no one's going to tell you to use an obscure font. But you know what? You go to an awful lot of websites that don't use good typography. All right? Good spacing. Mixing of serif and sans serif, depending on their respective roles. Sans serif for maybe smaller text and serif fonts for headlines. Um, all these things are things that can do it. And then you throw in maybe having some images. Even links was one example that, that is good. But even if you're going to have an article, maybe have a picture, and that picture will help the person with dyslexia put what the, the words that they're seeing in context. All right? And in that way, you know, if they see a picture, they have an idea of what the overall thing's about, and that may help them interpret some words if they're having difficulty with it. Certainly, other sort of learning disabilities. ADHD would be an example of a disability. Let me think. I think that mostly covers it. If anything pops into your head or my head, we can we can discuss it. Okay. Illiterate, I, I, I guess, uh, yeah, it's not the same really as learning disability, that, so that would be possible to, to do that. And it's amazing. I, I actually, years ago, I, I worked, uh, I volunteered as part of an adult literacy program. And it's amazing how people, you, you, you know, you might say, like, how would they even have a chance, you know? But like they they learn ways to deal with the world, you know, and um, they they recognize you know icons, pictures, um, and they uh, you know for example if they couldn't read a menu they might like point and like 
ask you know ask the waiter, oh well, what's this dish about here? You know, and the you know, and just and it's not necessarily obvious that they're doing that because they can't read. So. Um, yeah, there, there's all kinds of ways that, that people accommodate that. And, and we can do our best to accommodate people with a variety, uh, a variety of uh, disabilities. The, the last one, or I won't say the last one, but, but another one is age-related conditions. And this is one I know all too well. <laughs> It's almost like a little bit of each of them, right? I'm not deaf, but I find myself saying what an awful lot these days. Or pardon me, or whatever. I'm not blind, but I sure like when the font is big and I can read it. All right? And so on down the line. Now, let's think of what we can do for people with these disabilities. All right? Blindness. What can you do for people that are blind? We've looked at one accommodation already for people that are blind. What can we do? What was that accommodation? The all the attributes on images. All right. That's one accommodation. One thing to keep in mind is that there is impossible for us to give people with some disabilities the complete experience. In other words, if you have a photograph, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, as they say. Um, you can put a description on it, but it's not going to be the same as viewing the picture. But there's nothing that you can do about that. But you can at least make some accommodations to, to say that. Another one that I think we've talked about is making sure your, the text of your links is clear. In other words, don't have your link being something like click here for info about accounting. Click here for info about CISS. People with people that are blind will access the computer using a screen reader, a screen narrator that reads the screen to them. There's a rudimentary one in Windows. And let me let me fire it up just to give you a taste of what that's like. And um, when you hear this, it's going to be like, how can anyone access the web or a computer this way? Well, people do what they need to do to get by, right? People adapt to their circumstances. So let's go and let's see if we can let's see if we can hear it. This actually has a accessibility checklist that can tell you what your recommended settings are in Windows. I'm going to turn on the narrator. Now let's let's try accessing a page and see. Initializing narrator. Microsoft narrator window. Focus on location bar. Desktop backslash control panel backslash ease of access. Start on screen keyboard button. Set up high contrast button. Let's go to web, web page. Period. C O M. It's telling me what I typed. Enter. Start narrator button. Window closed. Location bar. Microsoft narrator window. 
Focused on quick help button. Ease of access center window. Focus on setup high contrast button. Start magnifier button. Google. Google Chrome window. Focus on and location bar. Desktop backslash control panel backslash ease of access backslash ease of access center. Okay. Focus start on screen keyboard button. Um. Window closed. Address and search bar. Editable text. HTTPS colon slash slash www.google.com dot main toolbar with one buttons. Google Chrome. As I tab around. Tab. 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 This isn't a particularly good. Window. Microsoft Narrator window reader. contains this would be narrator will read aloud what is on screen no, as you I, navigate using the keyboard. I don't mean, Main I don't narrator mean to settings say this to echo users keystrokes. Microsoft checkbox efforts, is checked. But, um, Announce for people that are blind, they typically purchase very specialized software to do this, um, and and it works a lot better for that. But again, you can see that it's very difficult to do that, but. If that's your only way of interacting with the computer, you'll figure out a way to make it work. Um, I think I told the story of when I had a summer fellowship at NASA. There was a blind high school kid that was working on the computer, creating PowerPoint presentations and all that. Every now and then, she would get something on her screen that she really didn't know like where she was at on the screen. She'd call me over, I'd take a look at it and help her sort it out. Well, good web design allows you to do that. A good separation of presentation and the content helps you do that. All right. So, assistive technologies is one way, um, and and for blindness, um, the all the attributes are an, are another way. Another way again is the the making your li link text meaningful. If all my links were click here. As I tab through the page, all I would hear is click here, click here, click here, click here, click here. If my link instead was accounting, CISS, engineering, then that would be what was narrated to me. You can use your tab key typically to tab through the links on a page and get to the navigation that way. So all the attributes. Having good text for links are two things that you can do to help accommodate people that are blind. What about someone that's colorblind? What can you do for them? Okay. You can you can do some testing that way. Um, pick colors that have good contrast. In other words, don't use a yellow. Um, font on a orange background or something along those lines. And it, it's funny, some of these um, almost sound um, ridiculous, like why would anyone do that? Yet I have seen examples of all these things, and I'm sure you probably have too. What's another way that you could do that? You could give people the choice of colors. All right. You can give people a choice of colors and let them decide. Um, hey, does this color scheme make it more readable for me? Does that color scheme make it more readable for me? Now they've incorporated a lot of things in the browsers to allow you to zoom a lot easier than you used to be able to. So zooming is one way that people with bad eyes can access a page, and that might help any of the visual things. What about people with physical mobility issues? Some of these things are pretty dramatic. All right. Um, I did have a student, I believe, with uh, an extreme case of cerebral palsy in one of my CISS 121 classes. All right. She actually um, could use the mouse, but could not use the keyboard very well. All right. There actually is an on-screen keyboard that you can use.
okay. And you get a keyboard. Now, she wasn't able to type that way, but she could, using the mouse, go and access it that way. So those are an example of an assistive technology. But what can we do as web designers to help people, possibly with not the most severe of these, but what can we do on our web pages to help people to have some of these motor control issues? Okay, separate your content well, and, and what do you mean by that? Okay, all right. Allow for spaces between stuff, white space. Don't have links too close together. Don't have links that are too small. All right, all those things would uh, potentially benefit that. Anything else that you can think of? You can actually add keyboard shortcuts to your page so that if you press a certain key, a certain link um, is invoked. All right. Seizures. How are seizures relevant with um, someone, someone's online experience? Yeah, a lot of animation, a lot of flashing, sometimes the kind of flashing, you know. You'll notice even if you go to amusement park rides, it will say this contains, this ride has a strobe light, and if you're prone to seizures, don't ride it or whatever. So flashing animation on the screen can trigger seizures. Now, this is where an interesting point comes up. The point was made before about using clear fonts was just good old plain web design. All right. When would you want a lot of flashing and crazy animation on your web page? Yeah, maybe. All right. I guess the answer to that is not very often. Under only under very specialized conditions. All right. Thankfully, we don't see as much of this as we used to. It used to be when you would go to a, a page. Uh, there was even a, um, a, a uh, uh, an old IBM commercial uh, about the flaming logo. You know, about uh, a, a web designer being very proud that they made the, the logo flaming with that. Fortunately, we don't see a lot of this gratuitous animation. All right. My point is, though, by keeping it simple, not only are we helping someone who could be triggered seizures by not including this gratuitous animation, all right, we're helping everyone else. Because no one else wants to download to look at your silly little animation. It was probably a lot of fun for you to create, but doesn't really add any value to the page. Does that mean that you never use animation? Of course not. That means you use animation when it adds to the content, when it's appropriate for what it is that you're doing. All right. For example, on a kid's site. You might warn then that this portion of the site contains this. All right. Um, you might allow people to turn it off. All right. But Again, you would not use it unless it was something that actually helped your web page. People that are deaf. What are things that we can do to help those people? Yeah. Um, closed caption on any videos. All right. I will say Google offers the feature of giving you captions on videos and a lot of times they're way off the mark. So if you have a video, um, it's best if you were to caption it yourself. All right. But the one thing that you could do is you could, you could uh, apply a transcript of the video. All right. um, a new site, for example. I, I hate when news sites only have a video of a news story. 
You know, here's something important that happened. Here's a video for it. Why do I hate that? Well, I'm a pretty quick reader, right? So I can scan through the news story to see if it's something that interests me or not, if I have a text version of it. I don't want to have to sit through a three-minute video to say, oh, that has absolutely no importance to me whatsoever. All right? I'd rather look at it, glance through, and then make the decision. I might be someplace quiet. I might um, not have headphones. I might be in computer lab and no speakers. I might be in a loud place where I can't hear it or whatever. I might be in a hurry. I might want to print it out and take it with me to read on a plane. Whatever. Having a print copy then would help me in that situation and it would obviously help someone that they can't hear. If you can't hear a video, hey, let's see a transcript of that video and, and the person can, can read it. Cognitive disabilities. We talked a little bit about dyslexia. What about some of those other ones? What are things that we can do? Remember, you can only do so much, right? If, if someone has a limited understanding or, or huge difficulties reading, you know, you can do the best you can, but you're not going to make the experience perfect for it. But what are some of the things you can do? Exactly. You could have audio, all right, or video. And that even for people that don't have cognitive disabilities, people have different learning styles. Maybe a video and hearing someone say something is easier for certain people, regardless of disabilities. And for people that have trouble reading, all right, or have other cognitive disabilities, perhaps hearing a video or, you know, seeing and hearing a video would be better. What about like ADHD? What are things that we could do or not do to help those people? Simple design. Not a lot of distractions. All right. Now, You know, I, I had a student back so many years that said something like, well, you know, if we do all these things, we're going to make very plain, very boring websites. And that's not the case at all. All right? Who wants a website to have a lot of distracting things on it? All right? For people with ADHD, that poses a particular problem. But even people just looking for their information, they don't want to have to sift through a pile of a million different things. They want the information to be easy and straightforward to find <coughs> as a general rule. Age-related condition is sort of a little bit of all of these, right? And what we can do there applies for everyone. If I can summarize this, if I can summarize these things, Three biggest things you can do for accessibility. Simplicity. Keep that in mind. Simplicity doesn't mean, you know, quote, dumbing down your site. It means not having things that don't add value to your site. Uh, I think it was Albert Einstein that said something like, things should be made as simple as they can be, but no simpler. All right? Um, if you are doing a website on calculus or college-level physics, yeah, there's going to be some complicated stuff on there. All right? I'm not suggesting that you dumb it down or whatever, but there's still ways that you can present complicated material in a simple way, or as at, at the very least, as simply as you can. Second thing that goes sort of a, in the opposite direction of this is having multiple 
presentations of same info. We saw several examples of this, right? We said that an image, one way of presenting some information, should have an alt attribute. That's an alternate way of conveying the same information. We said that a video or an audio clip could have a transcript. Transcript, video clip, two alternate ways of presenting the same material. We talked about text being accompanied by images. All right, text being accompanied by images. So that someone that's dyslexic, someone with other learning ability, uh, disabilities, that may help those people out. We talked about just the opposite of what we talked about for someone that couldn't hear. In addition to having text, have a video version. So having multiple ways to present the same data is useful. Now, this is where design comes in. And when I talk about design, I'm talking about making deliberate choices about how you're going to show something. These two things, in a way, conflict with each other, right? I mean, in one case we're saying simplicity means less, less, less. Here we're saying more, more, more. Well, you find the balancing point, all right? You don't, for example, have six ways of presenting the same material, a little animated video, a live action video, an audio clip, a, you know, a textual version, uh, done as a poem, done as a sonnet, does as a, done as a song. You know, you don't do that. You don't overkill. But you figure out for your audience what is going to best express that. All right? So as a designer, you sort of balance this. You want to present the same thing different ways, but do it in a simplistic way. The last thing is, number three, when possible, give user choice. Now, that's not, that requires a little bit more uh, advanced things, things such as JavaScript and server-side scripting. So we don't really get into that in this class. But do keep that in the back of your head. As far as this class goes, know that the better that you separate the HTML from the CSS, the better chance you have this of occurring. We've already seen how we can take the same HTML file and apply different CSS to it to make it look wildly different. Well, that happens only when you have a good separation between your content and, present, and presentation or appearance. Then you can do these great things and allow people to choose their color scheme, for example. Choose the kind of font that they use. Turn images on, turn animations on or off. Turn audio on or off or whatever. All right? So in a nutshell, this is accessibility. All right? Um, we will talk about some specialized cases of accessibility um, as we get to them. Uh, we have approximately three topics remaining, if I'm not mistaken. We have uh, forms, we have tables, and we have JavaScript. So forms and tables, at the very least, um, definitely have some accessibility implications that we'll talk about when we talk about those topics. Are there any questions? My aim is to have your project design graded over the next day or so. All right, I want to give quick feedback because I know you folks will be, um, you know, you won't want to get feedback on it so you can continue working on it. My suggestion would be to continue working on it regardless. Uh, but I will aim to get these graded as, as, soon, as, uh, as soon as I can. All right, we'll see you down in lab.